this SESTA training webinar on the GDPR. It's titled What to Want to Collect Personal Data? An Introduction to Processing Personal Data for Research Purposes. First, a couple of practical things. I will remind you that this webinar will be recorded. Within a week, you will get an email with information on where the webinar is published. Um, some other um, information. The presentation will last for up to 40 minutes and there will be a question and answer section the last 15 minutes. So the webinar will last for approximately an hour. And please remember to be muted during the webinar. Regarding question, you can ask and write questions in the question box that you can see on the GoToMeeting. Um, we will then move your questions to a document where we will, the presenters will answer as time as they have time to. Um, the presentation today are Eva J.B. Payne and Ina Nepstar. They are both working at the Section for Data Protection Services at the NSD. So then I will just open with say welcome to Eva. You can start your presentation. Hello. So as my colleague uh, Gri said, uh, my name is Eva Payne and my colleague uh, Ina Nepster. We're going to today be talking about um, what you have to think about when you're going to collect personal data for research purposes. So to start with, uh, a short overview of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, we've chosen uh, what we consider the most important points to think about uh, when you're going to be collecting personal data. Uh, so we will start with presenting what is processing and give an overview of the data lifecycle. We will then talk about what personal data actually is and present some of the most important terms that you should know. Um, we will then discuss the GDPR and why this is relevant for you as a researcher. What actually is a legal basis for processing personal data? And then what rights actually apply for the people who you're processing data about and what these mean? We'll cover the principles for processing personal data. And then in the end, social benefit of research seen in relation to potential risk for your participants. So why this is important to consider. And along the way, we'll give some useful tips, uh, things that we've learned from our experience working at the Norwegian Center for Research Data and carrying out assessments of research projects that are notified to us. So our job, what we do on a day to day basis is we uh, we carry out assessments of projects that are notified to us and we help researchers um, achieve the purposes they want to achieve at the same time as considering a data protection legislation. So now to the first slide. So what actually is processing? Uh, this term is defined very broadly in the GDPR. Processing entails any operation which is performed on personal data, such as collecting, registering, download, downloading, recording, structuring and combining, uh, storing personal data, sharing and transferring, publishing and even anonymizing and deleting personal data. So in a very simplified uh, way, you can say the processing is actually anything you can do with personal data. So it's very easy. Uh, based on our experience, researchers often focus on which data they're going to be focusing on in their analysis. And also uh, very conscious, obviously, of what they're actually going to publish in their research findings. But it's important to consider processing on a much larger scale 
which actually contains all of these different aspects and more. And also instead of considering separate processing activities, it's also very useful to think about data as having a life cycle. So beginning with data collection, going through to stages of analysis, uh, storing of data, and then later perhaps archiving, and then future reuse or sharing of this data. So it's very important to think about um, yeah, the future of your data uh, at the beginning of data collection. So what we can call data management can sit, uh, will take into account all of these aspects. So how data will be collected, what the plan is for organizing, structuring and, and analyzing your data, and then how later how it will be stored. And it's important to consider if it's uh, applicable to your project or to your processing, sharing with others, either within or outside your institution. And then uh, perhaps archiving of data and then uh, future use. So our first tip today um, is to think ahead during the planning stages of your process when you're planning which data you're going to collect and why. Try to think through the whole life cycle of your data and um, be prepared to collect good data. That's a very important tip. Uh, you'd be surprised how many times researchers have not expected to get as good data as they actually do. And they haven't thought ahead and they haven't thought of the potential of how this could be reused both by themselves, but also other researchers. So try as much as possible to think ahead. Yes, so thank you, Eva. So now I'll talk to you about personal data. And the term personal data <clears throat> is the entryway into the application of the GDPR, or General Data Protection Regulation. And personal data are any information which are related to an identified or identifiable natural person. And the data subjects are identifiable if they can be either directly or indirectly identified. And since the definition includes any information, one must assume that the term personal data should be as broadly interpreted as possible. And what we call directly identifying personal data could be name, could be address, telephone number, email, birth number. And an image is considered personal data if people can be recognized and audio recordings could be personal data even if no name is mentioned in the recording. Biometrics, for example, are used to confirm identity. And used properly, a biometrics can be a good and effective tool for identification. But it is important to be aware of the pros and cons of the methods. And examples are fingerprints, iris patterns, and head shape for face recognition. And furthermore, IP address is also defined as personal data. The registration of the number of a car could be personal data if it's linked to a specific person. And information about behavior pattern is also considered personal data. And information about what you shop for, what shops you go to, where you physically move during a day, and also what you search for online is also examples of this. And in addition to the general personal data, one must consider above all the special categories of personal data, also known or previously known as sensitive personal data. Uh, and these are highly relevant because they are subject to a higher level of protection. And these include uh, health data, as well as personal data revealing racial or ethnic origin, political opinions, religious or philosophical beliefs, trade union membership, sex life or sex orientation, uh, criminal convictions, and offenses. And also, people can be what we call indirectly identifiable. That is, even if the information itself is not identifying, such as a name, a person can become identifiable through the combination or the information 
uh, the combination of information or maybe of variables. And detached variables can make it difficult to say whether a person uh, uh, or whether you are processing personal data or not. And this will, of course, depend on, for example, the topic, the contents, the sample size, and the type of information. And a person will be indirectly identifiable if it is possible to identify the person through background information such as gender, age, workplace, income, nationality, and so on. And if, for example, you have um, a group of people, and you want to study people with a given diagnosis, and you have a sample of about 40 to 50 people, uh, and then you add age, <laughs> then the selection becomes smaller. And if you, in addition, add occupation, place of work and income, then it's quite possible that we know who the person is. Next slide, please. And anonymous data, uh, that is data that cannot identify uh, in individuals in the data set, neither directly through name or through social security number, indirectly through background variables, nor through a list of names, or an encryption formula or a scrambling key. In order to make your data material anonymous, you need to go through all your data and remove or edit identifiable information in such a way that individuals are uh, could no longer be recognized. And usually this entails uh, deleting all directly identifiable data, such as names, uh, lists of reference numbers, or scrambling key. Uh, it entails deleting or rewriting or grouping together indirectly identifiable data, for example, background variables such as residence, workplace, school, age, and gender. And also it entails deleting or editing photos uh, and audio video recordings. And if you use a data processor, the data processor must also delete all personal uh, information connected to the project which they possess. And note that in, uh, in most cases, you could lawfully keep an anonymous data set after the end of the project since you're no longer processing personal information. And in this case, you need to make sure that you have edited the data material so that individuals could no longer be identified. And however, in some cases, you do have to delete all your data. And this might happen if you have promised a sample to do so, or when it's a demand from the data owner, for example, if you're using registry data. Uh, what is GDPR and why is it relevant for you as a researcher? Uh, as many of you probably know, the EU's General Data Protection Regulation has entered into force on May 25th, uh, 2018, and it replaces the EU's previous legal framework that dates back to, I think it was 1995, and while retaining the overall regulatory approach of its predecessor, GDPR also introduces a number of new compliance obligations. Although the new legislation has not been designed specifically for research, it's important that you as a researcher understand what GDPR means and uh, the personal data uh, you are processing. So <laughs> why did this happen, if you could say that? The main points of GDPR. Uh, is that it harmonizes data protection legislation in Europe and it gives controls to individuals over their personal data. And the protection of natural persons in relation to the processing of personal data is a fundamental right. And it enables free flow of personal data between member states, whilst also ensuring high level of data protection. Thank you. So our second tip of the day is uh, for researchers that are planning on collecting personal data to think about first and foremost legal basis, rights and principles. So these three aspects that we are now going to um, explain to you um, should be considered before data collection but also before each stage of your project. And, and these are essential. And if you have considered these three aspects, then you'll have considered um, what is 
most important from a data protection perspective. So what is a legal basis for processing? Uh, the legal basis is basically the legal grounds for processing personal data. So processing of personal data is only lawful if certain conditions or grounds apply. And to find out, okay, what are these conditions and grounds? Uh, you go to Article 6 and Article 9 of the GDPR. So for Article 6, this covers what we call general categories, um, categories that aren't considered sensitive. And Article 9 is then the special or so-called sensitive categories. Um, and we've, we've decided today to present the two legal bases that are most uh, relevant for you as researchers. The first one being consent to process general categories of personal data or explicit consent to process special categories, for instance, a person's health data. So for consent to be valid, it must be freely given. It must be specific. The person should know what they are consenting to. Uh, so this is obviously then linked to information given. It must be informed. It must be an unambiguous statement or action. There should be no, um, it should not, there should be no, it should be very clear that a person has given their consent. Um, it must be possible to demonstrate that a person has given consent. Often this will then involve some form of documentation, whether it is a written signature, it's an email confirmation, or perhaps even a person confirming their consent orally on a sound recording. Uh, this sound recording then will be able to demonstrate that this interviewee has given their consent. And uh, also very importantly, it should be as easy to withdraw as to give consent. So to read uh, all of these specific uh, requirements for consent, you can see Articles 4 and 7 of the GDPR. And the other legal basis that is especially relevant and which names research explicitly is the processing of personal data for a task that's necessary in the public interest uh, with research being considered a task in the public interest. Uh, and if you're going to be processing special categories of personal data, there is a specific legal basis uh, in Article 9, which refers to processing for archiving purposes also scientific or historical research purposes or statistical purposes. So here the GDPR actually narrows in very specifically on research as a valid legal basis um, and that is found in uh, Article 9 number 2 uh, J in the, uh, in the GDPR. So with this legal basis it's very important to consider which safeguards are going to be in place. With safeguards, we mean what kind of technical and organizational measures will be used. So um, uh, secure storage of personal data, um, limiting access to how many people will have access, access to this personal data, and, um, and also having respect for the principle of data minimization, which we will now go on to explain. Um, but before we do that, we're going to discuss quickly uh, what rights, um, what these rights, what rights data subjects have, and what these rights entail. Um, so perhaps one of the most fundamental rights of the data subject is the right to be informed. And hand in hand with this is your obligation as a data pro someone who's going to be collecting personal data, your obligation as a researcher to provide this information. So what does information actually do? It ensures fair and transparent processing um, and it ensures that the person uh, knows which personal data is being collected, why and how it will be used. So there are certain requirements for form and content, which you'll find in Articles 12, 13 and 14 of the GDPR. Information should be clear, easy to understand. This often will involve adapting the information to fit the audience. Um, and it should be um, 
it should be very clear and accessible. That's the most fundamental aspect of form. But when it comes to content, um, here I've listed up some of the content requirements that you'll find in articles 13 and 14. Uh, and the reason why I've, we've included um, for a lot of information on this slide is to show why it's very important to consider uh, at the very beginning of your project, actually what your overall plan is, what your research purposes are, what you're trying to achieve, and what, uh, what potential there is in your data. Because when it comes to information uh, content requirements, uh, you're required to inform which institution is actually responsible for the project, whether that's your home research institution. Uh, contact details. Uh, you should explain clearly what the actual purposes of processing personal data are and what the legal basis is for this processing. So all of these things must be considered, for instance, before you're informing a potential participant about what part participation involves before they, for example, give their consent. They should be given information about who will actually have access to their personal data, whether this is the project group, any uh, external researchers that are involved in the project, but also data processes. Processors. This can be anything from a transcription agency to uh, cloud surfaces, um, anyone who is outside uh, the data controller, which is therefore the, then the institution responsible for the, pro for the project. Um, if applicable, if personal data is going to be transferred to a third country, um, this should be informed of, and also what the legal basis is for transfer. This doesn't mean that you can't plan a transfer at a later point, but when you're basing uh, processing on consent, then you should give a very clear indication of this transfer before the person agrees uh, for you to process their personal data. So as, as I said, it's very important to plan ahead as much as possible so you can inform people about this transfer at the beginning of the project. People should also be given an idea of uh, how long personal data will be processed. Um, so how long it will be stored as part of the project, perhaps if it's going to be archived in the future, uh, and what criteria will be used to determine the time, time period for processing of personal data. You should also inform people about their rights, how to exercise these rights, and if they're giving consent, the fact that they can withdraw their consent at any time. So these are just some of the most important points that should be given uh, in the information for data subjects. And other rights, therefore, are uh, right of access, uh, right to have uh, incorrect personal data uh, corrected or rectified, uh, the right to erasure of personal data, this is often very relevant then if someone withdraws their consent, uh, then the collected data is then made anonymous. Uh, right to restrict processing. And if you've given consent to processing, a right uh, to have receive a copy of your personal data. Uh, if you haven't given consent, you always have the right to object to what's taking place. And there are also many rights in relation to automated decision making and profiling. And which is a trend, obviously, in new technological technological developments. Um, so this is part of uh, the reason why the GDPR has actually uh, been implemented. And anyone has a right to lodge a complaint if their personal data are being uh, processed. And you lodge this complaint then with your uh, sub supervisory authority of the country that is responsible for the processing. These rights you'll then find in Articles 15. Uh, to 21 of the GDPR. And then um, perhaps one of the most important things to remember is that these rights apply so long as the data subject can be identified in the collected data. So as uh, so long as you're processing personal data and it hasn't yet been anonymized, uh, these rights apply for that individual. There are of course uh, exemptions, exceptions from these rights, but they should be justified and they should have a legal basis. So if you want to read more about what exemptions exist, you can go to Articles 15 to 21 of the GDPR.
so tip three, um, it's very important to be realistic and for researchers not to limit themselves unnecessarily. And obviously with the word unnecessarily, we mean that there should always be a balance taken into account the type of personal data being processed. Um, but again and again, based on our experience, we often find that researchers do underestimate um, how long it will take for them to achieve their research purposes. Um, they may uh, give their duration of their project uh, maybe six months or a year, when really they, they need more time to actually achieve these purposes. So try and be realistic. Obviously, it'll always be within reason and uh, you should consider what the actual risk is for individuals. Um, but um, yeah, give yourself the time you need to actually achieve your research purposes. Um, it's not necessarily to delete all of your personal data at the end of the project. In fact, uh, it's recommended that you don't do this unless there's a particularly high level of risk. Um, and we recommend, however challenging the GDPR seems, that uh, you gain guidance um, uh, when planning your project and be uh, realistic. So we would say that anonymous, anonymized data can and it often should be archived for future research purposes. But again, think of those three aspects that we've just uh, started to cover, legal basis, rights and principles. And there should also be a reason why you're archiving or storing personal data and not anonymous data. Uh, there should be a reason why it's necessary to have data where individuals are identifiable. But again, consider what type of data, uh, especially sensitive data, um, should perhaps not be archived in a way that's very openly accessible. Now, uh, Eva just explained the various legal grounds for lawful processing and zoomed in on some of them. Obtaining consent or having another legal ground for processing, of course, is just one step when it boils down to personal data processing. And uh, when legal basis exists, the processing still needs to happen. And there are, there are indeed clear principles regarding the actual processing of personal data. And the principles for processing personal data on the GDPR can be found in Article 5. And the first one, lawfulness, fairness and transparency. Uh, the principle of lawfulness pretty much speaks for itself. The processing of personal data should be done in respect for, uh, of the data subjects, interest and reasonable expectations. And the processing must also be transparent and understandable to the data subjects. It must not take place in covert or manipulative ways. So uh, what's that, what does this mean? Uh, well, the concept of lawfulness states that processing of personal data must happen in a lawful way and thus have a legal basis which means uh, which makes the processing legitimate and the data um, this includes data collection data storing and also data processing fairness means that your actions whether you are a data controller or a data processor must match up with how it was described to the data subject simply put keep the promise you gave the participants in the information letter before collecting their data. It must be a fair game. <laughs> and use personal data only for the purposes and during the time period that you indicated. A clear notice is what the concept of transparency is about. The data subject must stay informed. Uh, please go back, uh, Eva, thank you. Uh, you should let your sample know what exactly you are going to do with their data and who will have access to it. And transparency requires uh, that information and communication with data subject just doesn't just happen, uh, which is part of the transparency principle as well, but um, also is done in a way that data subjects can understand it. For instance, pointing to the fact that the language is easy to understand and that the information is easy to find. And also the use of long texts full of language that only lawyers could understand should be avoided as the information needs to be concise. Next, please. 
purpose limitation. So the take home message, be specific. As I said in the concept of fairness, you need to stay true to your promise. In the information letter, uh, beside other things, you must inform the participants about the purpose of data collection. And as stated in the legislation, the purpose must be specified, must be explicit and legitimate. And data can be collected and used only for the purposes that have been transmitted to the, the, the data subjects and about which was uh, with the concept was uh, received. Thank you. And this takes us to the data minimization. And the take home message here could be collect the minimum data you need. And GDPR is designed to bring data collection to the necessary minimum. Personal data to be collected should be adequate, relevant and limited to what is necessary in relation to the purpose for which they are processed. Okay, so note that under GDPR, you will actually have to justify the amount of data collected. So make sure to design an adequate policy and document it, which uh, Eva mentioned earlier. And this means uh, limiting the amount of personal data collected to what is necessary, uh, but also uh, you need to get the amount that is, um, <laughs> you have to uh, take as little and as much you need to achieve the purpose of the project. And if personal data is not necessary to achieve the purpose, then the principle of data minimization speaks in the direction of not collecting them. And this uh, principle may also be relevant in assessing the number of persons to be registered in the data set. Next, please. So uh, accuracy. Store uh, accurate, up-to-date data. And accuracy has several meanings and certainly several areas of application, but it basically states that personal data must be accurate and where necessary kept up to date. This means that you must make sure that you do not retain old and outdated data and you must make sure to erase inaccurate personal data without delay. Next, please. Storage limitations. So retain the data for a necessary limited period and then erase or anonymize. The principle relates to data minimization uh, and states that personal data must be kept in a form which permits identification of data subjects for no longer than necessary. You would have to set the retention period for personal data you collect and justify that this period is necessary for your specific objective. And do not forget to document it. Thank you, next please. Number six, integrity and confidentiality. So the take home message here, keep the data secure. This is the only principle that deals explicitly with security. The GDPR states that personal data must be processed in a matter ensuring appropriate security, which in include protection against unlawful processing or accidental loss, destruction or damage. The GDPR is deliberately vague about what measures organizations should take because technological and organizational best practice are constantly changing. And currently organizations should encrypt or make personal data less identifiable whenever possible, but they should also consider whatever other options that are available. So it's basically up to you to keep the data safe. Okay, uh, the last one accountability. Uh, the principle of accountability is the final one in GDPR Article 5. And you are responsible for compliance with the principle in the GDPR. And the new legislation requires a, a thorough documentation of all policies that govern the collection and the processing of data. And under the new law, you must be able to 
to demonstrate documents that prove the compliance with the GDPR when requested by the authorities. And the data controller must establish all necessary organizational and technical measures to ensure that the regulations are complied with at all times. And this means that your institution must be able to show that it actually acts in accordance with the legislation. New slide, please. So uh, the social benefit versus the risk or disadvantage for data subjects. Well, the processing of personal data for research purposes should be based on a balance between the social benefits of the processing and the potential risk or the potential disadvantage for the data subjects. And there are, way, uh, there are ways um, to reduce the disadvantage, to make the data less identifiable, to have good information security and to make it easy to exercise rights. And all depends on the scope of the data, uh, the degree of sensitivity. And risks to the rights and freedoms of the data subjects depends on, for example, how sensitive the data is, how easy it is to identify individuals, the, the quantity of the personal data that you collect for your research project, and how securely the data is being stored. So as you can see, all of this is based on the seven principles. And ways of reducing, uh, reducing risks are therefore, limiting, uh, the uh, are therefore limiting the amount of sensitive data and making individuals less identifiable. Thank you, Eva. So for our uh, final tip of the day, um, at the beginning of your project, obviously we've, we've got a lot to consider and we've uh, covered a lot of what must uh, be considered now during this presentation. Um, but one final tip that we think is very useful and important to communicate is uh, as part of this planning to also plan uh, for how you're going to organize these data you're collecting and to have a system. Um, so uh, a lot of stories from researchers may be that, um, uh, that when it comes to the end of their project and they are have anonymized their collected data and it's going to be potentially archived and they want to make it available for other people to reuse, um, that they actually maybe have forgotten uh, which interview was which, which interview was which. Um, so we would recommend to have a plan for this right from the very beginning, um, part of security but also having a sense of a system and organisation is to store the names of your data subjects separately from other data but with a clear system and for you to have metadata about uh, the data that you've collected kept up to date and also uh, to keep this data. So thinking ahead in the future of your data and the FAIR principles, which are that future data should be findable, findable accessible, interoperable and reusable, which means uh, having uh, a way of identifying your data, uh, perhaps a DOI, data object identifier, and making it accessible to others so they know what your your data contains, um, having it readable on different platforms and also reusable for others, so it having a meaning for others. So whether this is then anonymized data or personal data, uh, we recommend that you plan ahead and have a system not only for information security but also to make this data reusable for both potentially yourself and for others. So thank you for listening today. And uh, now we'll go on to uh, the question uh, section of the presentation. Thank you very much to Eva and Ina. I think that was a good presentation and we have had a couple of questions. So we will just start with them. If, um, you both can open the document where we have 
the questions. Um, we have some comments also from, uh, from um, Scott Sommers that uh, we have put in the uh, question or chat. I think you have some links in the chat uh, section you can also see. Um, and we have at least seven or eight questions for you. So if you, you will just, can you see the document, both of you? Yeah. So you can maybe just start on the first question. We have about um, 15 minutes to, uh, to answer questions. And if some of you out there listening have some more questions, feel free to, to write them down in the question section. Okay, over to you, Eva and Ina. Okay, so um, question one on the list. Um, I'm tweeting now and your names and pictures are there as part of the screenshot. Uh, consent has been given that I would be live tweeting, though you did not give me your written okay. So I'm technically breaking the rules. Am I right? So um, by, I understand the premise of this question. Uh, is that uh, we have given our consent as presenters um, for this to be live tweeted. Um, though you did not give me your written okay. So am I technically breaking the rules? Um, that challenging, interesting question. Um, I would say that uh, what we have given our consent to is to take part in this webinar on certain premises and uh, with this information not only being live streamed but also being later published uh, on YouTube uh, openly available on certain conditions we're then aware that this data can potentially be uh, be referred to on the conditions of the actual publishing of this data so I would say that we haven't explicitly given consent for this to be uh, live tweeted um, but we've been we've given consent for it to be made publicly available so we, one could argue that the actual live tweeting of this data um, is uh, should we say it's 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 kind of understood within that consent but no we haven't given consent so for you to to live tweet this data um, uh i'd say you yourself have a, have a <laughs> have a responsibility um if if you're tweeting as a private person um then the gdpr uh, does not necessarily apply to you but if you're tweeting on behalf of an organization then it is the organization you're tweeting on behalf of that has uh, has to make sure that uh, um, is within what we've given our consent to. So technically you could be breaking the rules, I would say. But I was also say that most likely, I'm not quite sure, I apologize, I don't actually know who, who you are who's asked as this question, uh, but as a private person retweeting this, I'd say that uh, the GDPR doesn't necessarily um, apply to your reuse of this data. Do you have a, do you have any opinions on this, Ida? I felt like I was at, kind of thinking <laughs> through the question as I was answering, so I'm not quite sure whether that was very, very uh, concise well, and uh, well thought <laughs> through. But uh. I think it was a very good answer, uh, Eva. And also, I have to add, uh, you write that um, uh, you didn't give me your written OK. So uh, if we said OK just orally, that would uh, count as uh, a, a, a consent. However, you would be, uh, you would have to be able to document it. So unless you videotaped us saying OK, then um, I agree with the Eva. Yes, you uh, could technically be, be breaking the rules. Yeah. But obviously, when we're then assessing uh, how say the rules have been broken uh, what is then the disadvantage to Ina and myself um, we have chosen to participate and make this presentation our names our positions and our experiences public 
Um, so it is to a certain extent understood by us that this information will be out there. If you tweeted about something about my personal life, that would be different, but the content of the presentation is within, uh, is within what we're, we've understood to be uh, reused. Uh, should we go on to question number two? Um, yeah, if you're processing, on. yeah, uh, if you're processing text written by individuals, is the text without metadata considered anonymized, even though individuals could mention names or other personal information in there without the researcher's knowledge? Um, let me just give one second just to reread that. I think that my answer to this question would be uh, no. Uh, anonymized data is by definition data where it is that it's not possible to link to any individuals in any way. Um, so if you have, if you're asking individuals to participate in a project in which they're writing texts that they are then sharing with you, um, this data cannot be considered anonymized unless you as a researcher have actually gone systematically through the text and deleted any potential names or any background information that could identify either the person themselves or any third persons. So if they've whispered specifically to another person other than themselves. Um, so for, an, for data to be fully anonymized, uh, you have to consider both anything that would link this data to that individual, which is both, for instance, name, uh, but also any combination of background information and the contents of who you've invited to share texts and why could also be relevant for anonymizing this data. Some samples are very uh, limited and very specific, which will make it a lot easier to identify um, not only the person themselves, but others that they may have mentioned. Do you have any? Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, another brilliant answer, Eva. <laughs> I think that's good. <laughs> yeah, maybe you want to take um, have a look at the next question. Yeah. Uh, so the third uh, question: In a project with many international partners, what happens when partners want to use different legal bases for data processing? For example, public interest versus consent. Uh, Okay, so um, I think you have to maybe uh, back me up on this one, uh, Eva, but uh, first of all, why would you use different legal bases if you collected the data based on, for example, consent, uh, then you should keep uh, using consent as the legal basis. And um, uh, I think if you collected the data based on consent, then you would have also informed the participant that uh, you would share the data with the international partners. Uh, otherwise, you would not have a legal basis to actually share the data. So, uh, in my opinion, you should stick to just uh, one uh, legal basis. What do you mm. think, uh, Eva? Yeah, I think um, it will also depend on what the roles of these different partners are. Of course, um, you can imagine you can imagine a project where you have several uh, data controllers uh, that have a joint what we call joint data controllers, a joint responsibility. They've all from the get go uh, decided on the purposes of processing and also on which data will be collected and why. Um, and from experience, we do know that in certain countries there is a certain tendency to favour public interest as a legal basis. And perhaps I think I would be right in arguing that in Norway, uh, consent has always been uh, preferred above other legal basis. You should always argue why consent isn't appropriate at the same time as you argue why public interest is the mm -hmm. most appropriate legal basis. Absolutely. Um, but from a research perspective, uh, you can't ignore research ethics. 
um, and the actual I think we probably need to have a bit more a bit more information about what this data processing actually entails to be able to help you in a more concrete way but as a rule if you are in direct contact with your participants or your data subjects um, there should be perhaps a reason why consent isn't the legal basis and um, whereas if you're reusing data that it's been made accessible for instance uh, social media data then I think all partners that are actually responsible that are data controllers should come to, come to an agreement on what the most appropriate legal basis is and I think either way this has to be justified it has to be documented um, and yeah, I think that's probably the best answer we can give without any more specific yeah, specific information about what type of processing is taking place. Yeah, and hopefully this was uh, was an answer to your question. Yeah. Um, let's um, have a look. Question number four. Uh, yeah, we've still got six minutes, so we'll continue. Uh, would sharing the data via repository so that it becomes available to anybody or at least any researcher interested in the data count as a data transfer mm -hmm. as described on the slide on data subjects rights and informed consent if yes how should this be dealt with in the informed consent is stating that the data will be shared via a certain repository sufficient so i would say um uh, not necessarily to, not necessary to define this as a data transfer but it's a certain way of processing data when it's uh, when it's then stored with the data repository um, so I'm, I'm not sure whether the the most important thing is whether it's defined as a data transfer or not um, but it's a way of processing personal data and it needs to have a legal basis as we said um, so how should this be dealt with in the informed consent? Um, basically, uh, you'd have to, as you gain consent, um, either you know already that your, the data is going to be stored in this repository or not. If this is already part of the plan and it's already uh, thought through, then in the information that's given before the person consents, um, then they should be given basically all of the points that were in the list of uh, contents that I went through um, it should people should be made aware this data that's being stored is it actually going to be anonymized form or is it going to be personal data if it's going to be in anonymized form then the GDPR uh, won't apply but if it's going to be personal data then people should be given an idea okay what group what categories of recipients will be able to access this data and from what types of purposes so if we're going to base this uh, this storage and reuse on consent um, for instance you could say um, the researchers will be able to access this personal data uh, within a certain range of research purposes for instance a health research on a similar topic for what um, topic to why it was actually collected in the first place um, but also if you have um, a project um, that has a list of participants has their names and addresses this is stored separately uh, and a version of the data is made available in this repository it's not completely it's not it's possible to gain a new consent for reuse of this data for a new purpose so uh, to to answer this question, you it, the first the first uh, important thing to know is whether this is actually personal data or not, whether the GDPR applies, and um, to give as much information as possible about where it will be stored, why, and for what future purposes. But also um, there is a potential to gain a new consent for use for new research purposes that are outside the scope of the original purposes. There are, so there are a few different solutions depending on what type of data and how and how far in advance this data storage has been planned. Uh, do you have any any input on that one, uh, Ina, or perhaps even uh, Gris? Uh, 
Uh, I think uh, you covered uh, um, on the basis of my knowledge, but maybe agree have uh, have some additional uh, um, input on that one. Yeah, no, I think I think you you cover the most. Um, it all depends on which legal basis you have and, and um, what you have informed the uh, informants about. And also um, to say that it's in one uh, repository or archive, um, as long as long as it's informed. So I, I think you have covered the most of it. Um, and now we have only two and a half minutes left of this webinar. So I think I want to thank uh, you, Eva and Ina, for the presentation and for the answering of the questions. Um, some of you have asked if the presentation and the slides will be available after the webinar. And as I told you in the beginning, the webinar will be available uh, at the SESTA training website. You will all get an email uh, within a week. Um, with a link, I think. Um, so, uh, and we have, I have registered like 25 different questions. I will have a talk with uh, Eva and Ina and see what we will do with it, if, we, if it's possible to, to answer them and send you emails, or if we will have a, a question and answer document for you after the webinar. So then I will just so, okay. say, if I could just say yeah. something. Uh, yeah. Maybe since there's a lot of questions and many of them are really interesting. I think it could be an idea to just uh, for us to to write the answers in the document and then share it to whomever might be interested. Yeah, that's a good idea, I think. So then I will just say thank you and thank you for everybody who has. Um, participated in the webinar and for all your questions and comments. And just to say that this is a very interesting and difficult and exciting theme. So then we will just say bye. Bye. Thank you for listening. Bye. <laughs> bye. This video is produced by the Consortium of European Social Science Data Archives. For more information on SESTA, please visit www.sesta.eu.